well, officially good morning, John. Good morning. <laughs> uh, for the uh, <coughs> camera, uh, uh, I'm Richard Gill, and this is John Doerr, who we're going to talk to this morning for the historical uh, records of the 11th Circuit and the Middle District of Alabama. And uh, the uh, uh, John is here for a kind of a double occasion, as it turns out. Uh, in Montgomery, and one is the dedication of the Judge Frank M. Johnson, Jr. collection at the Federal Court Building, and the second happens to be that it's the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides uh, that occurred in immediate proximity to the Federal Building, and uh, in which both Judge Johnson and Mr. Dole were participants as to the legal matters associated with them, and, uh, and although that's part of a larger tapestry, I, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, your relation with Judge Johnson and, and those events as they interacted with those things and, uh, and uh, appreciate you visiting with us because this is, the court's very interested in preserving uh, your memories and thoughts about that. Um, John, you're now living in New York and working in New York, is that right? That's correct. And you uh, began your career with the Justice Department. I did. And tell us how you came to uh, know Judge Frank Johnson. I was practicing law in a little town in northern Wisconsin, a town of 2,700 people. My father was a lawyer, and my brother was a lawyer, my cousin was a lawyer, and uh, my father was a good trial lawyer, and so we had a practice across the northern part of northwestern Wisconsin. And I had been practicing there f for 10 years when I got a call from a fellow that was a class ahead of me at Princeton named Tyler. And he offered me the job of being his first assistant in the Civil Rights Division. His call came in the spring of 1960, and I thought about it for overnight and said I would do it. And uh, my family and I moved to Washington, D.C. from New Richmond, Wisconsin, arriving the day after the 4th of July, 1960. And I worked in the division, Civil Rights Division, until the end of December 1967. Well, those uh, <laughs> those years <laughs> marked a uh, major series of events in the development of the civil rights in this, in this country. And uh, uh, how did it come to bring you to Montgomery from your uh, assignment in Washington? Well, uh, when I got to the uh, Justice Department, the Civil Rights Division was the newest division in the Department of Justice. It was very small. I suspect that there were not over 25 lawyers in the division, and it had, it had jurisdiction over other statutes besides the Civil Rights Act of 1957. And actually there was only five or six lawyers in the division that were working on voting rights, which was the essence of the 57 Act in which the Civil Rights Division was created to enforce. Um, what I found when I got there uh, that uh, None of the lawyers ever left their desks in Washington, and uh, they uh, processed cases through requests to the FBI and responses from the FBI with respect to factual matters, and uh, then worked with U.S. attorneys with respect to the actual formal papers in, in the uh, federal courts. And I think there was maybe two or three cases pending involving the 1957 Civil Rights Act. 
Um, it so happened that uh, on a Saturday in August, I think, I went down to the office in, in Washington, the Justice Department, and there were two young lawyers there working on a batch of FBI reports about claims of discrimination and intimidation in Haywood County, Tennessee. And uh, I offered to help those lawyers review those FBI reports. And after reviewing them, there were questions that you couldn't get, weren't answered in the, in the papers. And so I said to Tyler, the next week, I think I'll go down there to Tennessee. And uh, he, he said, that's okay. And uh, 1960, the summer of 1960 was a, was a period of American history when uh, most of the political people in Washington were concerned about the election. And uh, therefore, you had quite a lot of freedom of doing what you thought was the right thing to do uh, as a as a lawyer uh, charged with enforcing uh, particular statutes. So out of that case, out of that experience in Haywood County, we we brought a major intimidation suit against farmers and bankers and merchants in Haywood County for exercising economic pressure to remove tenant farmers, black tenant farmers from the land uh, because they tried to register to vote. And uh, skipping ahead uh, very quickly, there was another case in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana, in Prov Lake Providence and involving a cotton farmer who testified with respect to his experiences in trying to register to vote. And uh, that, in, that testimony was reported in the Louisiana papers. And uh, the next day, the sheriff came to his farm. He was a 100-acre independent farmer, fine man. Uh, and said, uh, don't bring any more cotton to the gins to be, to be ginned. And why? Well, because of civil rights. And uh, so he was shut out of his farming business. And we, we went down, I went down from Haywood County after we'd had a hearing before Judge Boyd in December. And uh, we prepared a case against the, the Jenners in, in Louisiana and uh, filed a case on the 19th of January, uh, 2000, no, 1961. Um, so the, that, <clears throat> that was the background of the first call I got from Judge Johnson, which was maybe a week to 10 days after the Kennedys came into office, the yeah. latter part of January. How old were you when you, uh, in 1960 or 61, when this began? Well, let's see, I was uh, just 39. You, you spoke of the, there being young lawyers in the office. You were a relatively young lawyer yourself still at that time. Well, if I, these, these young lawyers were, were just on law school. <laughs> All right. That, that, that were, but they, I, I, I want to say to you that uh, uh, th two or three of them, particularly two of them, both of whom are now dead, uh, were absolutely fantastic lawyers. And they'd come to the Justice Department through the honors program and had found themselves assigned to the Civil Rights Division. And it was a great thing for the country that that happened because they made a each of them made an enormous contribution in bringing about changes uh, in the 60s. At any rate, um, Tyler, of course, being a Republican, uh, when the 
administration changed, he left, and so for a few days I was in charge. And it was during that time before the new assistant attorney had even come to the office, let alone being confirmed, uh, that I got a call from Judge Johnson. And he said to me that he was setting one of those two cases that I mentioned in Macon County for trial at Opelika on the 23rd of February. Uh, and uh, three w it was really, really three weeks away. And uh, this was really the first time that I had, I hadn't really got up to speed as to just what the status of the case was. It was being handled by a, a senior uh, trial lawyer in the division named Ben Brooks. Uh, and, uh, but I did what I'm sure you would have done is if you got a call from a federal district judge and saying you're setting a case, you said you'd be there <laughs> and you'd be ready. And uh, so I called uh, Brooks into the office and, and said uh, that I just talked to Judge Johnson and I told him that we'd be ready to try the Macon County voting case in three weeks, and he said he couldn't do it. He couldn't be ready until the fall. And I, I told him that that just, that just uh, couldn't be. We couldn't respond to a federal district judge like that. And uh, he said, well, he couldn't do it. Well, then I said, I'm going to have to replace you. And uh, I'm, I'm one of those young lawyers I referred to as a fellow named Bob Owen. You know, He's very, very good, and, and uh, uh, besides that, I'll help you. Uh, and uh, so uh, the other young lawyer that I spoke about, Dave Norman, and I uh, took off for Macon County. And we came down here over Valentine's Day, 1961, <coughs> and went out to Tuskegee and started to investigate uh, what really hadn't been carefully investigated there before. Uh, and we found that we just had a t t tremendous factual case of discrimination. Uh, and uh, um, at that time, the uh, case in Tennessee was up in the, up and down in the Sixth Circuit. And so I was back and forth to Memphis and Cincinnati on that case, and uh, <clears throat> I think the case was tried on February 20th to February 23rd. This is the Macon County Macon case. case in, in, in Opelika, and uh, I think I got there to observe the, how things were going and if, see what I could do to help if it was needed. It was really not needed because Bob Owen and Dave Norman were doing a good job of putting in the, the facts, and of course, we had uh, we had good witnesses, both good black witnesses and good white witnesses, and uh, uh, we had the records, and so we uh, began. That was how we began to master how to present voting cases to federal courts, and. Uh, <coughs> Did Judge you know John anything about Judge Johnson before that call? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have any any history about him, and uh, I don't recall looking to get any background about him. Uh, but uh, 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 he, as I observed the trial, I could see that this this was a this was a real judge. Uh, this was a man that had command of his courtroom, and that uh, he ran a court uh, like a court should be run. <laughs> he did that. And, and from one, and uh, he was on top of everything. Uh, and the atmosphere in his courtroom was one of respect, respect for the oath, respect for the, the law, respect for the federal courts, respect for the Constitution, 
and uh, he made it clear to everybody that uh, if he was going to direct something to be done, uh, people were going to be accountable to him for doing it. And uh, uh, so, as I say, that case was presented for, for three, four, four days in February, and uh, I think he decided the case on the 17th of March, if I remember, within a month. And uh, he gave the Justice Department a, a great victory. He ordered a number of black citizens to be immediately registered. He laid down the, the most sig significant thing that he did was that uh, he established that in a situation where most of the white people in the county were registered and few of the blacks were registered, that uh, the standard in the future for determining whether or not a citizen was eligible to and qualified to vote would be measured by the least qualified standard applied to former whites. And uh, we had established in that case, which was really <coughs> the tip of the iceberg, but was, was that if you were white, first of all, if you were black and if you had a college education and you were, uh, had all kinds of ex experience as an adult, uh, the chances were pretty, pretty slim that you, that you get registered in Macon County. On the other hand, if you were white and you lived there and you breathed, you voted. And uh, you know, so that it was, it was uh, <coughs> what, we, what we scratched at this, the tip of the iceberg is that this, is, was that this whole voting system, this whole laws and regulations in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana designed purportedly to achieve a, a, an intelligent electorate was nothing more than just the worst kind of fraud and corruption. And But we only saw it in one county at that time. And uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, then, um, for for the for the remainder of 1961, <coughs> uh, uh, registrars in Macon County were resigning, and Judge uh, um, uh, Johnson was was uh, putting pressure on Governor Pat Governor Patterson to appoint new registrars and. They'd point one, and then he'd really resign, and then he'd get another one, and back and forth. And Judge Johnson was making it clear that if he, did, he didn't get registers in there, he was going to do it himself. And uh, so that back and forth during the rest of 61, there was uh, any number of times, and I don't, I, I don't, uh, uh, can't recall without going back in my papers just exactly when those pre proceedings went on, but, uh, and I don't believe I was directly involved with those uh, matters, uh, except uh, through Bob Owen and Dave Norman, who were before Judge Johnson. Um, what, after, after the, after the, Macon County case was uh, was was uh, uh, tried. Um, uh, the strategy that we had at that time uh, was a developed by the, as I say, this group of about four or five lawyers was that we were going to bring a voting case, discrimination case. If we could have the f establish the facts uh, in each of the federal districts in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, and in that way we would keep the federal judges in the traditional black belt of the South uh, busy, 
and uh, uh, we would run it at uh, those judges as hard and as fast as we could. And uh, so the, f the f there was no voting cases pending in the Southern District of Alabama. And so as soon as uh, I left Opelika, I went over to Selma and uh, investigated around there. Um, and uh, um, out of that investigation, um, the Justice Department, the Attorney General filed the first vo voting case in the Kennedy administration against uh, the registrars in Dallas County. That was the first voting case that came up after the administration changed. And um, uh, in the preparation of the case, it was just like the preparation of any case. You were getting your witnesses, reviewing the records, uh, getting to know the lay of the land. It, it was, uh, I think looking back on it, I was fortunate to have had the experience as a small town lawyer and in relatively rural court courthouses in northwestern Wisconsin because uh, you, you, I know you appreciate one of the things you've got to know is you've got to really understand the court family. You've got to understand the courthouse. You've got to understand the clerk's offices. And, and I was comfortable with that kind of, 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 of personnel. And uh, it wasn't that all that different in the rural courthouses in Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana. So anyway, uh, I was over in uh, Selma working to prepare for a hearing before Judge Thomas in, um, I think, about the 16th of, of May. Uh, I'd been there before, but we were still getting ready for a hearing. And uh, at that time, the Freedom Rides started in, in uh, Washington, D.C. on the, uh, um, May 4th. Now, uh, by that time, uh, Burke Marshall had been appointed by the attorney, by the president to be the head of the Civil Rights Division. And uh, um, he had been confirmed by the Senate. And he was, in, he was then in charge. Um, Fortunately for me, he, uh, I never worked for a more brilliant attorney than Burke Marshall, and he was uh, not political in the sense that he wanted to get a first assistant that was a member of the uh, Democratic machine. Uh, and so uh, his attitude was that if you do good work, and we get along, uh, as long as it's all right with the Attorney General, you can stay. And my kids were in school, and uh, I was not, uh, I liked what I was doing, and so I was working hard, and, uh, and was, nobody had said anything to me about leaving, and I hadn't said anything to them about leaving. And. Uh, Looking back on it, uh, I can tell you that the Justice Department and the federal government was uh, not not prepared uh, for what eventually took place at Anniston, Birmingham, and Montgomery and the Freedom Rides. Um, because this might be viewed by another generation down the road, do you mind? Uh, giving us a little background as to what the Freedom Rides were to give us a context. Well, the, there was one of the uh, civil rights organizations called CORE, and uh, that was managed by a fellow named Jim F F Farmer. And it, uh, they had had a 
they had had a, a, a rider from in 1947, I think, in which they had gone, tried to go through the South uh, on buses, on interstate buses, uh, with the in, uh, integrated uh, passengers. I don't recall uh, how successful the, uh, what happened with that, but uh, they had the Corps had that tradition of having had one earlier so-called freedom ride, and but didn't wasn't called a freedom ride, but they were had that, and they the farmer had come in and taken over the responsibility of managing Corps, and he had come out of the NAACP, and he had been frustrated with the slowness of the bureaucracy in the NAACP. And uh, when he got into uh, managing Corps in February 61, he uh, and some of his colleagues, staff workers, uh, said, let's have an, another freedom ride. And they surveyed it. And they had, he had one or two fellows working for him, I think. And uh, they outlined a plan of going from Washington, D.C. To, to, to New Orleans by bus, and a, a, no, no special bus, but just a regular interstate commerce bus. And some of the, there'd be two buses, one on the Greyhound line, line and one on the Trailway line. And they would uh, test the Supreme Court rulings with respect to the fact that buses and, and uh, bus stations across uh, the country uh, had to be uh, they were desegregated. There couldn't be any white lunch counters. There couldn't be any white bathrooms and black bathrooms in the bus stations, and there couldn't be segregated seatings on the buses. And they were going to the Corps was going to test that. And uh, they um, pretty carefully uh, screened the people that were going to go with them, who volunteered to go on the buses. And these people were, uh, some of them were pretty experienced with, with uh, um, the testing of, of uh, segregation statutes. And uh, uh, they, were, they had a couple of principles. One is that there would, if there was any violence, they would not, they would not react with violence. It was going to be nonviolent, but they were going to be prepared to accept violence if, and accept in injury if that there should occur. And second of all, that uh, if they were put in jail, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, put up bond. They'd stay right in the jail till they served whatever sentence they were given. Uh, but they were, uh, they were, the, 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 the fifteen or fifteen or so people that were finally selected to go on that ride were, were uh, um, um, pretty pretty. Knowledgeable with respect to uh, what the laws were, with respect to uh, what the federal law, what the Constitution was, and then what the state laws were with respect to segregation. Um, <clears throat> now, at that time, uh, this was not something that was on the radar of the Civil Rights Division. First of all, um, we were. I told you we were, we were very, very modest with respect to people, and, and we were working on voting. And second of all, uh, the Bureau uh, that just generally had a, a system of sending out what was called letterhead memos, uh, advising them about racial problems, uh, were uh, uh, pretty incomplete or or slow with respect to uh, alerting the Justice Department of what was going on, and uh, finally, at the same at the same time during that period, uh, Mr. Marshall, I think, 
uh, w w became sick for a few days, and so um, I can tell you that the Civil Rights Division w weren't thinking about the Freedom Rides in, from the 4th to the 14th of May, 1961, and uh, uh, certainly uh, people that worked with me, we were we were in Dallas County, or we were getting ready to go and survey Mississippi, and, and we were probably in the cases in, in Louisiana. So that was, so the Freedom Rides took off on the 4th of, of May, and they made their way through Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina, and they, they had some little difficulty as they got into South Carolina, they were the bottom side of North Carolina, but they arrived pretty safely in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, at that time, uh, Jim Farmer had to leave the Freedom Rides because of his sickness in his family, and uh, the uh, responsibility of the management was, was, was left to a fellow named Peck, James Peck, I think. And uh, I think in about the 14th of, of, Feb of May, um, they, left, they set out from Atlanta to go to Birmingham. And the first bus stopped at Aniston, and a group of whites there blocked their exit to the, from the bus station and uh, um, let out the air and some of the, one or more of the tires of the bus, and the bus, the bus finally pulled out of there, but uh, it didn't get more than a mile out of town before it had to stop on the side of the road. And uh, there the, somebody, uh, after the bus stopped, some white guy uh, took a, um, uh, some kind of a wedge and uh, hammer and broke a window and then threw in a, 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 either a smoke bomb or some kind of a incendiary and the bu bus got on fire. And uh, uh, it, it was some, some kind of a, um, at first it wouldn't, the, the door wouldn't open, but then I think the, the, the group of men, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a, exactly a mob, but it was 30, 40 men around the bus. They pulled away from the bus and then somebody was able to open the door and all the people got out of the bus safely, except that they were, they were smoked in the eyes and it was, it was a, it's, uh, then the bus, the bus burned, this bus burned. And then the other bus got to Birmingham and, and they were in, at the bus station and uh, it was apparent that the uh, police department and a fellow named Connor uh, uh, and must have told the Ku Klux Klan people that they could have 15 minutes to rough up the, the passengers before the police would step in and stop it. And some of the, the Freedom Riders got banged around pretty good. And that was where it was on the 14th of May. And uh, uh, a fellow named John Sigginsaller, who was Robert Kennedy's assistant, newspaper man, uh, was down in, uh, he was from Nashville, he was down there. I can't remember how or why he got to himself into Alabama, but uh, he and I were uh, really the eyes of the Justice Department in Alabama from the 14th on. And uh, uh, I don't remember um, what was going on. I, I can tell you that that uh, uh, I had absolutely no experience in in uh, uh, what might happen uh, in a situation where there was a confrontation between federal law and state custom with respect to race. And uh, 
uh, I had no uh, experience of the fact that uh, local police departments would would just uh, lay, lay down and not not meet their responsibilities with respect to maintain law and order um, and but the the effort was made to by the Robert Kennedy and uh, to try to persuade the freedom riders in Birmingham and the ones that had come from Anniston that uh, you know you've 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 made your point but it's just uh, reckless to keep going and uh, th that first group of freedom riders decided that they would fly from Birmingham to New Orleans and uh, there'd be a, things that cool off. Well, the problem was that, that there was a group of young college students up in Nashville uh, led by uh, a, a woman named Diane Nash and also by John Lewis. And actually, John Lewis was a student at Nashville, Fisk, I think, and uh, he was one of the original Freedom Riders. Um, but when they heard that the Freedom Riders were going to give in and, and not go on through Mississippi and Louisiana, they said no way, and they organized uh, among themselves a group of 15 or 20 that would go and pick up the Freedom Riders in, 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 in Birmingham. So they went from Nashville to Birmingham to replace them original Freedom Riders, and when they got there, I can't remember the details, but Bull Connor arrested all of them, put them in jail for, for some period of time, short period of time, and then packed them all into uh, police vehicles and drove them up to the Tennessee-Alabama line and just dropped them off and said, you can get back to Nashville on the railroad down the road. Well, they, uh, instead of getting back to, to Na back to Nashville, they just got arranged to get picked up and taken back to Birmingham. So they're all in the bus station and being secured now by a police around and they're waiting to get a bus driver in and finally. And uh, the one point, the, um, so I remember that the, uh, Marshall said they were thinking about having me go up and talk to the governor, but then they decided, um, Robert Kennedy must have decided that uh, with me having the label of being in the Civil Rights Division, that that would not be, look like it was being an uh, effort to, to uh, mediate and cool things off. And so they, they said Sigenthal would go up to um, Birmingham from Montgomery, and I stayed in Montgomery, or I think I went up back out uh, to Dallas probably on the 19th of May and was working out, working there for the day and came back that night. And that night I, I, I drove by the bus station and I did, it. I observed groups of men hanging around the bus station, and uh, but uh, I didn't. Was uh, unsophisticated and did, didn't realize this, you know, that, that these guys were members of one or more of the clans and that they were there just waiting to beat up the, the Freedom Riders. And then the next morning, uh, finally, uh, through efforts of Robert Kennedy and working with Governor Patterson, uh, Patterson finally, uh, after Floyd Mann, the head of the state patrol, said that he could protect the Freedom Riders. Uh, if he was told to do so, uh, uh, the governor said he would he would protect him. And so they finally got a bus driver and they started out on the morning of May 20th. And uh, and this they got to they got to the city limits of, of Montgomery safely. They had four or five police cars ahead of the bus and four or five police cars behind the bus and a helicopter above the bus. And, uh, but when they got to the city limits, uh, 
the state police turned over the responsibility of maintaining order to the city police. And when the, when the, when the city police, uh, when the bus came to the bus station, there were no city police. And as the Freedom Riders got off the bus, there was uh, a crowd of people, newspaper people, and uh, these uh, hanger-rounders, these rough, roughnecks, right at the, at the entrance of the, of the bus. And there was a crowd of people right there, and, and in the middle of it was John Lewis, uh, and a fellow named Swig, a white guy. So we had a, a black and white there in the midst of the group of, of men, uh, uh, you know, nose to nose. And then there was a, there was a newspaper reporter off on the south side of the bus station and next to the courthouse. And that was, that was where I was when the bus came in. And I went and saw this guy uh, uh, attack the f photographer and knock him down and knock his camera down and then just kick the camera. And uh, uh, I went up, turned and went upstairs in the courthouse to call and give the, this information to, to the Washington. And uh, uh, at that time, the men, the, the, the roughnecks had grabbed suitcases and everything and were throwing them over the, into the parking lot of the courthouse, which was at the back side of the bus station. And the Freedom Riders, or some of them, were jumping over and into the courtyard and trying to get away. And, and as they got out in the street on the north side of the, of the uh, federal building, one or two of them were grabbed and were surrounded by a group of whites, and they were being beaten. One of them, two of them were being beaten, and, and uh, I was in the courthouse window upstairs and observed all that. And uh, I could look up the street to the north, and uh, boy, thank God, uh, I didn't know who it was, but Floyd Mann was up there eight or ten blocks away, and, and when he saw what was happening, uh, he came down and stepped into that and really saved that fellow's life that was uh, being beaten up on the street in Montgomery. And Sigginsall left. Before, before this all started, Sigginsall said to me, I'm going over and get my stuff because I'm going to go to the motel. And to give you an idea of, uh, we weren't thinking we were just going to see a big mob scene here in the next five minutes because he, was, he had left to get his car uh, to go back to the motel. And uh, when he got his car and came around by the bus station, there was a woman running across the street and he tried to get her in the car and he got hit in the back of the head with a pipe and was uh, laid out in the street in Montgomery on the other side of the bus station. So that was the, that was the uh, situation. Well, <clears throat> all things began to happen then. Uh, all the civil rights leaders, the movement, said, "We're not going to, we're not going to let this stop, and we're all going to go to Montgomery and have a, we could join the Freedom Riders." Dr. King came from Atlanta, and they came from, and. The t Attorney General decided he had to get some protection in there, so he organized under Byron White a group of marshals to go to Montgomery, and they poured into Montgomery. And uh, <coughs> I was instructed to get a case prepared uh, and go find Judge Johnson and get a temporary restraining order, ex parte, uh, to put us put a a stop on all of this. And uh, that afternoon, uh, between Washington and the courthouse in Montgomery, we got a case filed, uh, started, and, uh, and uh, uh, I learned that Judge Johnson was out at his cottage and reached him, and he said he'd see me if I got out to the cottage. He was at Lake Martin. In Lake Martin. And uh, uh, he had a Marshal or a clerk that uh, offered to drive me out there, and so that we went out to Lake Martin, and got there about 
11 o'clock at night and got in a boat and went across to his place on an island. And that's where I might really had my first one-on-one -on -one contact with Judge Johnson in, a, in a connection with the case because I wasn't presenting the case in, Man in Montgomery, in Macon County. And <coughs> he invited me into his kitchen and we sat across the kitchen table and I gave him the papers. He studied them, read them, didn't ask me any questions at all, and uh, signed the temporary restraining or ex parte restraining order and excused me. And uh, uh, I, I left. Uh, again, I couldn't have been more impressed with the way a judge uh, handled himself. It was all business. It was, there was no small talk. Uh, maybe there would have been small talk if I'd been a regular practitioner in his courtroom, but there was no small talk with me. It was all the papers. Did the papers state something that he thought warranted an ex parte restraining order? He didn't question me about it. He studied the papers. He decided. He signed them. Gave me back the papers and excused me. And that was it. Uh, and so I went back to Montgomery and we got the papers served. And then <coughs> the next Monday we, uh, we had this trial for a hearing on whether or not he would enter a, a preliminary injunction. And I think the trial went for four days. Uh, and uh, again, it was, a, it was a one in a lifetime scene in the court in a courtroom. It was a way, it, you know, it was a packed courtroom with uh, lots of lawyers. And uh, but again, he had command of the place, and absolute. And uh, his, his stature and his, his conduct was just exemplary. And uh, <coughs> so out of, out of that, I, I concluded that I would had the experience of really appearing before one of a kind judge, so to speak. And uh, uh, that experience has stuck with me since then. Uh, of course, historically, he did issue the. <coughs> he did. He, was, he did at the end of the four days. He issued the temporary, the preliminary injunction, and he also, without uh, getting any request for it, he also uh, joined the Freedom Riders and the black organizers, Dr. King and the uh, Reverend Abernathy, from engaging in any more of so-called Freedom Rides to test. The, and for the legality of the Supreme Court decisions on the grounds that um, he wasn't denying the right of uh, black citizens to, uh, to demonstrate uh, and protest uh, uh, the unenforcement or non-enforcement of, of uh, federal law. But he wasn't, if they had a situation where they had once established that there was um, uh, no enforcement that they, they couldn't continue doing it uh, um, because of the risk and danger to to other people that were traveling on the buses, and so he put a he put a cooling off period on everybody. The Klan, the police departments of Montgomery and Birmingham, and the leaders of the Freedom Rides. Was there a final adjudication in the case that followed the preliminary injunction? Well, I don't remember whether there was any final adjudication. It probably w was. I mean, but but uh, it just would fo it just followed the. Um, I think he probably lifted the, the whatever was uh, order was directed against the black organizations. But I really don't. I I just don't remember exactly, and I haven't had a chance to look at my files to tell you. Uh, I, I'm going to suggest we take just a minute break because I want to turn to some additional involvement between you and Judge Johnson, but 
since we kind of going to shift the scene a minute. Why mm -hmm. don't we? Take John, um, following the Freedom Ride events in the spring of uh, 61, tell me how your involvement here in the Middle District, your next <laughs> uh, involvement here came about and uh, what it consisted of in, in regard to Montgomery. Well, the, the, uh, after the Freedom Rides, uh, um, you may recall that uh, the uh, ICC Commission uh, issued an order in September uh, <clears throat> declaring that there be all be desegregation in all parts and functions of interstate commerce with bus transportation. And so the uh, uh, waiting rooms and the bathrooms and the, and the buses were, were desegregated. And uh, we went back to, to uh, again, concentrating on enforcement of the voting, voting laws. And we had brought in, I suspect, probably uh, September um, of 1961, a case in Montgomery County, Alabama. Now, um, by that time, Judge Johnson was way ahead of every other district judge in the three states with respect to uh, enforcing the 1957 and 1960 Voting Rights Acts. And as I said earlier, he, uh, he wrestled around with uh, the registrars and the, and the governor uh, with respect to Macon County. and by uh, the end of the year, the problem for, were corrected in, in Macon County. And uh, um, all citizens could freely register in that county. Uh, now, we had, another, we had the same problem that existed in Montgomery, but this was a, this was a big county and, a, and lots, of, lots of records. And... Uh, <coughs> I remember we photographed the records, and <clears throat> a young lawyer who had come to the division named Sather took on the job of analyzing those records. And what he what that meant was go sticking his head in one of those uh, rolling f f machines. I can't remember what they call and looking at these uh, voting records. And and if you can, it's hard to believe, but he noticed that on some of the application forms there was. Uh, dots at, at uh, opposite to where the form should be signed, and he made a, a list of the names of the per persons that had uh, dots on their applications, and, and uh, of course he couldn't determine what the race was, but he, he after six weeks of work, had, had a list of about 1,100 people that had uh, dots on their forms and they were they had been all registered and uh, he sent uh, by this time we had some techniques of how to work with the bureau and they, they didn't like it particularly because it was so uh, child work but we sent them the list of 1100 people and said determine their race and of course to go out and it, it just kind of insults them intelligence of an FBI officer to have to go out and find out what somebody's race was. But it turned out that every one of the 1,100 people were white. And then the, where there were no dots on any of things and the, uh, the applicant had forgotten or overlooked one or more signature lines uh, and they were rejected, these were all blacks. So we had a really a a big, big hearing here, here in Montgomery. Uh, again, uh, the case is being presented by Dave Norman and B Bud Sather, uh, but I was here and observed the way Judge Johnson handled that case. It took practically the month of, of, of January, but out of that case, he issued the second big uh, directive to the registrars to immediately register those blacks that had not been registered before for having failed to sign one, sign one or more of the places on the application form. And again, 
uh, he he took the lead. He set the standard for the judges, other federal judges across the South, district judges, in trying these cases. Now I must say that he didn't have any uh, followers, uh, and, and in some instances. Uh, as good as he was, there was other judges that were as bad. Uh, they were just upside down. But uh, uh, we found it just so happened that sometimes you could do as well with a with a bad judge as you could do as a, with a good judge with respect to moving the 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 law forward. Uh, my father used to tell me that. <clears throat> there are only two kinds of judges, good judges and bad judges. And if you're going to be a good lawyer, sooner or later you're going to have to reverse both of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, you just had to learn how to do that. And we learned. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, uh, I can't remember uh, my contacts with Judge Johnson. Uh, but it was more in 62, 63, and 64. There, I think he was involved in some school cases uh, with other judges. And, uh, and, and then uh, I would uh, see him and report from time to time just what the status of things were in Montgomery and, and, uh, and Macon County. And we also had brought a case in Bullock County, which was in his district. Uh, and then in 65, um, after the state uh, prosecutors were not able to get a conviction of the, the man, the Klan, that the murdered Mrs. Liuzzo, uh, we brought a, a federal um, conspiracy case against the conspirators, and I, I presented that case to Judge Johnson in the uh, in the Liuzzo murder. That occurred, uh, she was killed driving back from Selma to Montgomery after the, after the march in 65. And um, uh, again, uh, we had a very uh, strong case with respect to the evidence, uh, but uh, uh, the way I, f I felt that the way Judge Johnson handled the case is, was his, his uh, sternness and fairness and uh, determination that he was going to uh, enforce the law uh, uh, without fear or favor to anybody was uh, re really was pretty hard for a, a jury jury that was in his courtroom. Uh, not to do their duty. Uh, again, just for the context, uh, the man accused of shooting Mrs. Luozo was tried in Lowndes County and acquitted. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, in a state court proceeding. It's in a state court. And uh, the federal uh, conspiracy case then followed uh, That's right. after that. That's right. Uh, and uh, in the federal case, tell us about the outcome. Well, in the federal case, the, the people that were <coughs> killed Mrs. Liuzzo, uh, well, not the, there was the informant in the car that uh, uh, provided the information about who were driving the car and who was pulled a gun. Uh, they were convicted of a conspiracy, but that the maximum penalty there was 10 years because there's no federal crime of murder at that time. Uh, so that was a, that was a first, one of the first cases that, that uh, a local federal jury returned a verdict of guilty against uh, white persons that committed crimes against blacks. And uh, I should have also mentioned to you that, that uh, he was also a member of the three-judge court that sat over in, in uh, Dallas County uh, with respect to uh, the uh, in incidents that happened in, in 
March of 65. And when an order was entered that, that allowed the <coughs> civil rights organizations to demonstrate by marching or walking from Selma to Montgomery. And uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, present during that entire uh, walk. And uh, I tell you, you'd only get a chance to see maybe uh, two or three good, great parades in a lifetime. But the, when you saw those people coming into Montgomery and walking up to the, by that time there must have been 20,000, 25,000 people uh, at the foots of the courthouse and down the, whatever that street is down in the center of Montgomery. Yeah, Dexter Avenue. And uh, it was really thrilling. And uh, uh, he had, he had uh, allowed that march to occur and to interfere with normal traffic on the highway between Selma and Montgomery uh, on the basis that the magnitude of the injury to the blacks through lack of, informants, lack of enforcement of the civil rights laws was of such magnitude that, that the interference on interstate travel uh, was justified. And uh, um, now he limited the number of marchers when the highway <coughs> narrowed down to two lanes in part of the highway between Selma and Montgomery. But uh, that was, a, that was a, a, again, a great historic event in the in the period of time where the where the change occurred uh, in uh, the United States and uh, led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I uh, <coughs> I tend to think of the that period of time as is a situation where. Um, I heard a <clears throat> fellow from up at the School of Journalism up at Columbia once say that, that it remarked about that period is that uh, in 1960, the country f was confronted with what appeared to be an unsolvable problem, unsolvable problem. But by 19... 65, it was, and with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, it was solved, and the solution appeared to have been inevitable. And uh, so that you had a switch in historical uh, fact. The one time in the 1960s, a situation, a cultural situation in this country that is not solvable. In 1965, it's a uh, the solution is inevitable. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people were, were responsible for bringing that about. Uh, and, and it's, it, uh, of course, the, the ultimate, the credit belongs to the, to the, to the blacks that really helped the country uh, change. But, uh, uh, one person that stands out uh, is, is, is Judge Johnson. I, I, I want to ask you about him and as a personality in a minute, but I want to touch on one more matter in which okay. you worked with him. Uh, and I'm not sure I know the dates, but uh, there was a, uh, an investigation within the 11th Circuit after Judge Johnson became a, uh, an appellate court judge right. involving a district judge charged with uh, corruption. Uh, and tell, tell me about that. Uh, well, this was a, there was a federal judge, district judge in Miami named Judge Elsie Hastings, and he had a, <coughs> some mid-level mid mafia defendant in his courtroom, and, and he was up for, I think, sentencing. And, uh, there was a, um, 
effort made to uh, bribe Judge Hastings uh, to give a, a lesser sentence of this uh, fellow. And uh, uh, the uh, FBI got wind of it and they uh, uh, had an undercover agent uh, uh, contact the, uh, one of the lawyers in the case and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, um, the lawyer in Washington was convicted of conspiring to bribe the federal judge, but the federal judge was acquitted, or Judge Hastings was. And <clears throat> Judge Johnson really had a, had a, a deep love and affection for the federal court. And the idea that uh, a member of the judiciary in the federal system would engage in bribery it just offended him and uh, he was put on a uh, committee of, of circuit judges, circuit or district judges. It was just st there were statutes that provided for giving that committee authority to investigate whether or not a crime had been committed. And <clears throat> uh, as I s see it and remember, it, uh, Judge Johnson was determined that there was going to be a complete investigation. It was the investigation was conducted by Judge Godbold, but Judge Johnson uh, as one member of the five-member committee was determined that it was going to be thorough. And uh, he, uh, he suggested to Judge Godbold that the committee hire me to, to conduct the investigation. And so in the latter part of the 80s, uh, I worked with the commi this committee for probably two years um, investigating that whole transaction. And presenting the evidence to the committee <clears throat> and ultimately to the 11th Circuit in which it ultimately went to the Judicial Conference uh, in Washington and then the, the Judge Hastings was impeached and, and then removed from office. How rare an occasion is it for a federal judge in the United States to have been uh, impeached? <laughs> Very rare, probably three times. Wow. And uh, you and Judge Johnson remained friends throughout the balance of his life after we did, me. We did. And <clears throat> if you don't mind telling me uh, a little bit about him as a person, I, I know you've mentioned words like uh, his sternness and fairness. Uh, I know he paid a social price for his courage in uh, handling the civil rights cases and, and other difficult cases. And uh, I'd be interested in your memories and views about that, because uh, I, I know there was another side to him besides sternness. Uh, well, he, uh, after, after a year or two, since I was down here so much and in touch with um, the court with respect to events in the Middle District and he, of course, was on a number of three-judge courts. Um, I, I would say that uh, we developed a, a friendship, a personal friendship. Uh, uh, we, we liked each other, and uh, I had a chance to uh, visit with him about uh, his life and his experiences. He, his, he loved to fish. He loved to hunt. He was a... Uh, he, he was a a great uh, uh, companion to, to uh, spend time with. I think that, uh, that he was lonely because of a great part of that time because uh, he, what he was doing was not popular in Alabama in the early 60s. And his, his uh, struggles with Governor Patterson and then with Governor Wallace was just... Uh, he was, uh, he was not going to uh, 
uh, not use the federal court, not allow the federal court to be used to correct injustices. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, he was not. Uh, he was not uh, on the popular side of things in in Alabama at that time. So he was he was uh, rel relatively uh, isolated and lonely. And I think that that uh, uh, I had an opportunity to see the side of him that was um, made him a, an ideal friend uh, over that period. He, um, part of what's happening today is a, is a dedication of uh, some of his papers and memorabilia and artifacts and as a collection in the federal court and some of the furniture that he made. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it would surprise a lot of people to know that he was a, a very expert woodworker. Yes, he was. Uh, and um, made, I mean, seriously good furniture uh, as a hobby. Uh, and uh, that he actually had a side where he liked to tell stories and uh, lots of people who saw only the public face imagined he had no sense of humor or no levity or, or, or you know, warmth about him, but... Uh, well, that, wasn't, that wasn't correct. Uh, <clears throat> he was a good storyteller. He, he had lots of interesting things to say about life. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't critical of other people. He didn't, uh, he didn't discuss what... <clears throat> there was not a lot of eyes in his conversation. There was nothing, I did this, or I ruled last week in this, and I did this, and I did that, none of that. Uh, it was always, if you made a represent, it was the court did it. It was the court. It was the, it was the law. Uh, and, uh, but if he was telling you about some of his fishing experiences or his uh, experiences with one or more of the other federal judges, uh, it was very human. Uh, you, uh, I, I think that uh, we want to probably uh, include on this context, uh, you left the Justice Department, you said, in 1967, or the Civil Rights Division. Right. And um, you were in the private practice of law for a period after that. Right. And then in 1974, you became head of the uh, special committee of the Congress for investigating the impeachment of President Nixon. Is that That's it? correct. And uh, uh, served until that process was completed. That's right. And you then returned to private practice. Right. And uh, are still in practice. Well. <laughs> at a very low level at this time. Well, <laughs> it seems to me you've earned it. <laughs> but uh, if, uh, if you were uh, going to sum up, uh, because it, it, we are dedicating Judge Johnson collection this morning, if you want to sum him up uh, from your long personal experience with him, uh, what, what would you say for, for future generations to look at? Well, what I, what I would say is that uh, uh, the history of our country uh, will, will be that uh, in the 1960s uh, that uh, changes occurred that r resulted in the uh, elimination of what was uh, a dishonest system of self-government in this country from 1860 to 1965. And that uh, through the efforts of a great many people and through the efforts of black organizations in the 60s, that with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, the world changed. and. Uh, 
uh, we no longer have a dishonest system of self-government in this country. And this was uh, established without contradiction in the election of 19, 2008. And I don't speak in this particular time of the actual election of President Obama, but I'm speaking about what happened within the first two hours of the voting that day is uh, all over the country in the early parts of election day that day, it was reported that everybody who wanted to vote was voting. And uh, that was a, a major event that resulted in, in, as I say, the world turned. And uh, to, to illustrate that uh, is that uh, in 1966, there was an election in Dallas County, Alabama between, uh, for sheriff, and then between Jim Clark, the segregationist, seg and, uh, the seg segregationist sheriff, and Wilson Baker, the uh, decent uh, police chief of, of Selma. And prior to 1965, about 7,000 people voted at a primary election in Dallas County, and 95% of those people were white. And in that election in 1966, 17,000 people voted, and Baker beat Clark. And, uh, and that, those numbers were existed all across the South, and so that there was a major cultural change in attitudes uh, throughout the South in compliance with the law after 1965. And uh, when you say, well, who, who did, the, did the federal courts have anything to do with that? And uh, history has taught us that the federal courts are the, are the glue that hold this country together in times of crisis. And the federal courts during the 60s, from 60 to 67, did hold the country together while we were going through that period. And Judge Johnson was right at the f forefront of the federal judiciary with respect to correction of this unjust, unjust, dishonest, corrupt system of self-government. And it's, uh, he's, he belongs to history. Yeah. You know, uh, I had the privilege to practice before him, and, and I, you've described something that I'd like you to touch briefly on about how he conducted a trial. My, my observations were that there was no nonsense, but, and the law governed. He was very efficient and very prompt. And, uh, but I'd like your observation. Well, I, my, my observation is the same. One of the things I remember about him is that, is that uh, if he got, it got a little restless in the, in the courtroom, a little slow, he, he very often would stand up and he would uh, uh, hear the testimony of a witness uh, standing up there at the, uh, in the, uh, on the bench. And, uh, uh, that uh, there was a, f a formidable man up there when, when he was standing over the witness and, and listening intently and, and ruling promptly and absolutely putting up with absolutely no n nonsense, no grandstanding whatsoever. And uh, he just put a stop to that uh, before anything got started. And, uh, uh, you you mentioned uh, the fact that he, that he was prompt, and that's you know that's one of the things you admire about judges is that they're prompt with respect to if the hearings are going to be from nine o'clock till twelve o'clock, they're from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock. They're not they don't start a half hour late and they don't end a half hour early. And you talk about rulings, is you you don't wait a year and a half or two years for for a judge to rule. 
Judge Johnson ruled promptly. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, uh, and, and uh, um, if you just think about his ruling that, that the, oh, the standard for voters is going to be the least qualified registered person. Uh, and the 65 Act eliminated, eliminated in many, many counties where this problem existed any, any standard except just uh, residence and age. And when that was eliminated, the numbers of people that could vote and participate just expanded enormously. And it was that that pressure of the of the numbers that I don't think many people before it happened appreciated what elimination of corruption and voting could do to change a culture in this country. And Judge Johnson was the first. He 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 established the standard. And it, you know, it didn't get established exactly. Judge Reeves, it took Judge Reeves a, uh, a couple of years to, to believe that, that that standard was justifiable under the Constitution. But by 64, uh, the Fifth Circuit, in the cases known as U.S. versus Mississippi and U.S. versus Louisiana, had, had put, uh, of flesh on what Judge Johnson had ruled in Macon County with respect to the laws and the regulations of the states of Mississippi and, and Louisiana. And those rulings by federal officers, courts of appeal judges, had great influence on the Congress of the United States in deliberating on the 1965 Act. So the content of the Civil Rights Act, the guts of it, the heart of it, came right from Judge Frank Johnson. Uh, you mentioned uh, his tussles with Governor Patterson and Governor Wallace. Right. Uh, I, I will tell you as a matter of background that uh, Governor Patterson expects to be present at the uh, bus station ceremonies today which, uh, of course, Governor Wallace is deceased, but historically, it's my understanding that Judge Johnson and Governor Wallace were classmates and knew each other, and it made a very particularly difficult interaction, and I don't know whether you have any uh, insight about that that you can share. I, I really don't. I, I, um, I, I, my memory just doesn't have something that I can can re recall about that. I knew that that, that there was this this uh, wrestling between the two men, the two officials, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, Governor Wallace was the politician, and and he he uh, had a time in his career. He was saw the political advantage in hammering Judge Johnson. And uh, uh, Judge Johnson, on the other hand, was not going to uh, let the, the fact that he was being hammered dissuade him from going ahead and issue the rulings that he thought were required by the Constitution. Well, I, uh, I, I think that what you've had to say is uh, going to be an important part of the archives of this district. Uh, the, the Middle District has been a focal point of a lot of <laughs> these events, and uh, for better or for worse, in the sense of perhaps we wish someone else had behaved badly and uh, it led to these rather than us, but uh, uh, we really appreciate you, Thank you adding this to the court's history. And, uh, Thank you.